hey, hey. I'm just dancing to the music, having a good time. Like, I, I wish this went a little bit longer. But... Are we need to get some more solemn music or something. No, it's got to be peppy and upbeat so that we can watch each other dance in the little pre-show that nobody else can see that we should probably be recording for blooper reels later on. But... Join join our Patreon. You can see our dancing. <laughs> good luck with that. Uh -huh. um, but that is Justin Armenta from JA Digitizing Studios. And that is Matt Enderley from Patch Braid. And I'm Jeff Fuller from Fuller Embroidery Works. And we are here with the Embroidery Nerd, and today is a topic that actually Justin came up with, so I'll let you introduce it, Justin. Yeah, so I thought we'd talk about uh, machine issues, problems, maintenance issues, and uh, how to try to troubleshoot them and narrow them down to identify the exact problems so you know where to start as far as uh, the approach of fixing it or adjusting it or, or cleaning it or whatnot. So. Or throwing it away and buying a new one. Exactly. <laughs> they're, they're, just so, they're just so cheap. Just throw them away and get another one. I, to be fair, yesterday I had to throw away a bobbin case. It was not easy. No. <laughs> I, I've left it sit around for like three weeks. It doesn't work. And I'm like, <laughs> into the garbage can. And I looked at it and I was like, yeah, I'm going to have to take that outside right now. <laughs> That's why you just buy embroidered machines on Amazon and with that Amazon Prime. If it don't work, you just send it back. Yeah, two-day exactly. delivery. There you go. Yeah, or, or buy a new machine, put the old one in the new box, send it back. I didn't need it. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, serial numbers won't get you in trouble there. But no, uh, well, You just scratch it off. We'll go ahead and say hello to the people in the comments. We have John C. saying, oh, this should be really good. So I hope it is. And it's, I'm, I'm having fun already. Um, we have Barbara Fawn, good evening, from North Central Minnesota. We have Kingsbury's Crafts saying, hello, Barb. Hello, Embroidery Nerds. Hello. Uh, see, and she says hi to us, Minnesota Custom Made. There we go. And we have Frank. Uh, we'll catch the re replay. It's been a long day. And hi, Kingsbury. There we go. I caught up on comments. I feel accomplished. Ooh, end show. Roll credits. <laughs> Exit Wait, stage no, left. hold on. One more. Hello, Rich. <laughs> and hello to Susan from Rhode Island. And I'm going to take a break there. Uh, we'll see if any more come rolling in. But um, Justin, what kind of prompted you to think of this subject today? Well, we're in the middle of uh, ripping apart all our tension wheels on our on our eight head. So um, it just it came about where my my operator was noticing across the board he was he was having problems with false thread breaks. Um, there was a head that was shredding thread on every needle, um, just just kind of a ray. And in, 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 in our approach to to try to narrow it down is kind of what I wanted to talk about. And you know, he was he was getting really frustrated with an order uh, because all these problems seemed to to come out in, in this three hundred piece hat order. And um, and you know, to try to save this frustration, it's like, all right, let's 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 just stop and let's take one head at a time, analyze what's going on, and you know, depending on what the problem is, and if you could duplicate it, is it the design? You know, is it only isolated to a certain needle, uh, a certain thread, um, a certain head? So, especially on the multi-head machines, uh, it's it's something where you you have so many variables that you kind of have to kind of break it down to the the simplest form and say, all right, this is the problem. What are the things that we can look at that usually are the culprits for a problem like this? So, so was it because of your crappy digitizing that your digitizer did? Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, I was going to make kind of a similar comment, but man, if you guys aren't it. aware, Justin does the digitizing for other shops. So that was yes. a, a zing on him. Zing. At least it wasn't like if you want it flat. Yeah, the flat embroidery. <laughs> you know, it's 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 the same thing I get from my operators and, and the owner of the company right off the bat. It's the same thing. It's like, well, maybe we should look at the digitizer and see what the problem is. <laughs> but um, no, and and that's one of the things too that it, if it is a new design, um, you know, you got to look at the design sometimes. If this particular design is something that's an older one that we've ran many times and it's never been an issue. So right off the bat, I tended to not think it was a design problem. 
Um, so let me ask let me ask you this, Justin. For those that are out there in TV land that don't know how many machines you guys have, how many how many machines and what type and size do you have? They're all Tajimas. Uh, mm -hmm. We have two eight heads, a six head, and two single heads. Uh, okay. TFMX two are the six and two eight heads. Uh, the single head is in the same line, and the the smaller single head um, can't remember the the model number, but it's like the newer version of their old Neos that they had. It's the little bit more compact machine. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's they're all Tajima. So okay. So I've. I, when I was originally into the to the uh, industry, I was working on the older Melco machines, but uh, that that shop actually changed over to G to Jima shortly after I started working with them. So I've been pretty much on Tajimas for almost thirty years. So that's kind of the machine. The same Tajimas. Pretty much, pretty mm -hmm. much, just just you know throughout the years, just getting the newer model. Um, I, I've. We we're actually in the Discord chat talk, talking about the some of the newer models, uh, things that they have on it, and I was getting envious. Gotcha. But, um, but yeah, um, I mean, some of the things like I guess just narrowing it down to to one issue, and you know, when I was talking to my operator, um, he's talking about I'm getting false thread breaks. So a false thread break is where your your machine stopping, throwing an error code. It's either telling you that there's a upper thread break or a bottom th uh, thread break. Um, but when you check the the obvious, if if the bobbins ran out, if the thread has broken, if those things are are not the case, and you know it's selling and it just decides to stop, then you then you go from there of saying, okay, let's let's kind of travel backwards. Uh, up the up the path of the thread and see where we're at. So a lot of times the, the, it's most of the time I would say it's the most simple answer. Uh, the thread pathing somehow you know it's it's not on a tension wheel. It's not you know it's wrapped around something else. Uh, especially you know in our shop this type of year, the coolers are blowing, so that thread in the tops kind of moving with that air. So you know there's times where at the top tension wheel or top tension spring, it, it may wrap around the one, the needle next to it. So um, checking pathing. Um, the, in this case, uh, there is the the sensor in the back of the head that actually is the one that senses the, the thread breaks. So if you, if you've never taken apart a machine, kind of like I posted pictures of, here so back here this is the sensor right here that goes across this this bank of uh wheels in the back of your head and that's going to be and if that wheel isn't turning it's going to sense this a thread break um so there has been times where this this sensor itself has gone bad and we've had to replace those and it's just a matter of like getting into this little board and it's a ribbon and then the sensor actually is on a track and will as the, the head switches colors uh needle colors or needle it, it follows the the wheel that it's on as far as the tension wheel um this particular issue that we are having uh, turned out that some thread because it was happening on the same needle i'm sorry we narrowed it down that it was the same needle. It was the same head. So now we know we're isolating it to, okay, the problem's on head number one. The problem's on needle number 10. Um, so of course, checking all the obvious things that the thread pathing uh, was all fine. Uh, we were checking tensions and the tension was off. And we noticed that the, uh, the actual wheel that spins with the tension of your thread that activates that that thread sensor wasn't turning at all um so you know just kind of turning on the head watching it run and it, it would it would spin a little bit you wouldn't get that false thread break and then you could see it stop and the thread was just kind of running by it and so we would get that false thread break 
uh, come to turn out that we we looked in the back of the head. A lot of times, you know, we'll we'll, we'll take a um, compressed air, just kind of blow out that area, and make sure there's there's no debris that's in that sensor, that's you know not allowing it to work properly. Um, but it turns out that an errant piece of thread actually got in there, wound on the back side of that that wheel, and it was keeping it from spinning properly. Because it's like a, a shaft with a disc on the back side, right? That runs correct. Here. Yeah, correct. So on the front side, when you're when you're looking at it, on the front side, you know your your thread path is is wrapping around that wheel. So as your as your thread's running past it, it spins that wheel. And on the back side, like you said, there's a shaft, there's a disc, and that disc is the thing that runs in between that sensor. So it's it senses that it's it's spinning or not. So so we are. Actually, I have a feeling Matt might have one. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that's that's uh that's where it actually became that we narrowed it down to the needle the head same issue that's that we're repeating and you know just kind of going through the the most obvious first uh you know kind of the the normal day-to-day -day stuff as far as um thread pathing uh, you know sometimes it could be your needle uh we went through all the obvious stuff first right that's what we came up with so do you use the uh the thread nets use the what the thread nets no we don't uh over the years they've they've gotten old and fallen off and and i think a matter of i, I we, we 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 tend to let our operators kind of they have their own machines that they work on uh, other than kind of a uniform certain rules in in, in production styles that we go with we kind of let them go on their own as far as what they feel is the most uh, efficient and most, you know, their way of doing things. And over the years, I've noticed that no, none of them like it. Just a, I think it's a time factor as far as switching out threads and whatnot. Yeah, I mean, it also slightly affects your tension. And there we go. Matt with his tension disc. Yep. So this is one I just ripped off my Rakoma because the twelfth needle is broke, anyways, or the needle part <laughs> broke. Um, but yeah, what do you, so there's a shaft that looks like one of these, um, and it just goes through this block and I have a new one here. And then if debris, oil, dirt, dust gets in there, it'll stop it from spinning. Cause you can see that this one here, if I spin, this is where your thread gets wrapped around. Of course, it's not going to focus nicely, but you can see as I spin it, this disc is moving and there's little slots in it and there's just a little sensor that senses every time the light goes through and then that's what works and a couple of mine broke so i have replacements here just in case and then yeah exactly boom yeah so so on the back side of that shaft there was actually like i said there was an errant piece of thread that had gotten there at some point and because you know you have a, a spinning shaft with a disc, it wrapped around that piece of thread and just wrapped around it and, and, and kept it from spinning properly. So, so now, now I'm really curious. Did you have to take your head off to change that little wheel? Matt we said, yeah. well, That's Matt just did right now. No, oh, I'm yeah. not you. You've got a picture of your head that. laying flat on the table. So, oh, oh, oh. no, we well. It's it's funny because we were running through the individual like head number one the that was the head number one problem that he kept on having on, on needle I think it was ten. So I was watching the design run and it happened to be the yellow thread of the design, um, and and once I saw that that issue sh starting I went through the kind of the troubleshooting steps of the most obvious to um, actually I was getting stumped at the point where I, there is on Tajima's to, to access that back where, where the, the sensor does run across that channel. There is a part that you can just pop off, but you're still kind of leaning over the machine on a ladder, trying to look down in there to, to, to access it. Um, luckily enough that there was enough thread on the backside of that, that shaft that I was able to recognize it right away try to just reach in there with some tweezers and pull it out, but it was wrapped around there pretty good. So um, just going through some other problems with with uh, just tensions across the board uh, tend to be a little bit uh, off 
on certain machines and in just kind of all the tension problems that he was having throughout the machine. Um, that one was a little bit harder because we were talking about it wasn't uh, necessarily just narrowing it down to a single head or a single needle. Um, it was across the board uh, that he was that was having these kind of problems. And, and it, again, I, I think these are everyday things, especially when you are running a lot of production and you don't have time to give that tender loving care that you probably should on a, on a more often basis that we do. Um, but it, it got to a point where we were taking a look at all the, as far as maintenance issues that the, the tension problems could be. And this is when we decided to, um, decided to take the heads apart and say, well, you know what, let's, let's just could do a complete cleaning of everything that can possibly be dirty and gunked up. As you can see, just taking off just a couple of the, the top tensions here. You can see how much debris is built up in here. And so anything that's in the path of your thread that's going to not allow it to, to run through properly and you have that, that true tension test where it's just going through the tension wheels and, and, the, and the plates and whatnot, um, this is going to make this is going to not allow the, the thread to, to, to go th through freely and you're never going to get a, a proper tension um, right. I mean, you can sit there and crank down the, the tensioner and gunk like that is not going to let it close. So it's not really going to do anything. And exactly, exactly. So, uh, we kind of went through, took a couple off. You can see that it was, it was pretty dirty in there. And that's when I was get to a point. It's like, all right, you know what, let's take off all the, let's get, take off all the springs, all the, all the the discs and let's just clean it out and let's start from zero. Uh, not to mention, you know, over the years, uh, this particular machine has even had, you know, several operators on it since we got it. So if you look at all the tensions, uh, the levels of, of the different tensions of across the board, the needles, the heads, they're all over the place. Uh, so I just kind of wanted to, to get them all clean. So we know we're starting from zero. We know that all the tensions, when he's putting them back on, he's actually halfway through the machine now. Um, he's going to have them all just kind of have those knobs flush with the with the set screws. Have them all flush, all start from new. Uh, you know, there's even a couple of discs that we're going to replace because, you know, there's there's an obvious little groove or a little uh, burr in them that's going to definitely, you know, hinder that thread going through properly. So just starting from new and hopefully we can kind of kind of even playing field across the board and, and get our tensions correct. Gotcha. So. So is that fun unscrewing all them tension wheels or uh, tension knobs? I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, Matt, don't you have an attachment for your cordless drill? I do. I did make one. Do you really? I did. Yeah. yeah. It's a uh, 3D printed. Uh, so th this is this is the one for the happy. There's a little flat head on it, and then I just use the flat heads uh, bit in my drill. And then the one for the uh, butterfly, because I got really mad. Uh, <laughs> it's a uh, pretty heavy duty. They just oh, that's, slap. That's I have awesome. the drill has a clutch on it, so it won't over torque it. And you don't start it with the drill. Put it start it by hand, and then you come through and. Zip them down to. <laughs> I can see Matt like a race car wheel tire guy. Yeah. Well, I mean, like if you have ever taken one off all the way and you put it back on and you cross thread it, those are some very, very weak, uh, like metal bushings or whatever you want to call them in there, and they will strip out and it'll go. It'll be you'll be wailing on it to tighten it. But yeah, I have That's to awesome. find on Thingiverse. People can download it, but I can't find it. So. <laughs> trying your operator would have been really happy justin if you could just take the cordless drill and zip them all off yeah maybe yeah maybe well, I should hopefully talk to they're not watching it. this righty lucy <laughs> we'll, tighty. they'll be asking you tomorrow justin yeah he's like uh how come we don't have one of those um but that'd be a kind of a, a cool invention there matt to put out yeah but like you said you, you got to make sure that no one's hooking it up to some powerful drill that's ripping apart all the 
pneumatic drills. Let's just yeah. say if it's your father's or grandfather's Craftsman plug-in 120 volt drill, you should probably not use that one. Yeah. I mean, I would I would safely say it's for removing and not putting them back on. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a good disclaimer there. I mean, honestly, uh, I think I did only use it for removing because I had to take all 30 of them off. When I bought the new Happy, which is 48, that was one of the first things I did is just unzip all of them off real quick and then did it that the way. The first thing you did was design a file for that and 3D print it and then zip them all off, and it probably took him less time. Yeah, mm -hmm. it takes longer to set up the 3D printer. Well, you figure there is um, eight heads, 15 needles, top and bottom. So how many we have there? Oh, I, I forgot math. about that. So there's 60 of them. I can't math that quick. Well, there's 30 ahead times eight. The V96. 240 tension disks. 240 of them. Oh, for 15, yeah. Yeah. So That'd 240 of those. And he's 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 <laughs> halfway done with... with uh... Probably got carpal tunnel now. His, his hands only go like this. Luckily, this, this particular operator does enjoy uh, cleaning up and getting into things. He's, he's, he's really good at it. So, well, it's uh, fun to take it apart. Well, exactly. But it's just not fun when you put it back together and he, he has a box and says, where are all these go? <laughs> I'm done with your spare parts. Uh... Machines come with extra spare parts. They're just attached. Right. You take them off and put them in the bin. That's so uh, an, another head that he was having problems with was uh, the thread was, was shredding on him. Um, so again, uh, going up to that head, going to the obvious things, you know, asking the questions and, and it was actually watching it run myself, but uh, it wasn't isolated to a single needle. So you, uh, the way I kind of explain it to him is anything below bobbin casing, um, rotary hook, the, needle plate, ro rotary hook, uh, picker, all that stuff is, is if it's the problems down there, nine times out of 10, it's going to be happening on every needle because that's going to be your stationary parts that are not going to change no matter what needle you're running. Um, if it's from the needle above, if the problem is only happening on, on the needle itself, there you go. Thank you for the visual aids there, Matt. Everybody needs spare boxes or rotary hooks. Yeah. Yeah. We got plenty. And then we, we always have the, the idea of, of, of having the extras, which, you know, you always intend to do that. But there's always that time where you use the last one, you make the fix, you're trying to get back into production, you completely forget to order that that extra one again, and then the next time around, which we're kind of facing right now with another reciprocator. It's um, overnight shipping. Exactly. Uh, we have we have an eight head right now that's running as a seven head because I need to replace another reciprocator. So, well, stop hitting the hoop. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a whole other story. Um, but anyways, the uh, the it's all digitizing. It's it's all <laughs> digitizing. Yeah. Um, I just need to stop doing those errant stitches that are six inches to the side of the left chest design. It's called anchoring. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, something else is just explaining to him as far as, you know, something that's happening on, on every single needle, you look at to, to something that's going to be affecting every needle, which is the bottom, bottom half of your sewing area, uh, needles all the way up. Typically, if you can narrow it down to just a single needle, um, then you can know that it's from either your needle, your pathing, uh, your thread itself, uh, somewhere in that, that top half of your needle of your sewing uh, or, your, or your machine is, is what you kind of want to look at. So this particular uh, problem was the, the shredding of the, of the thread um, was happening on every needle on this particular head. So I knew it was something that needed to be in the, the bottom half on the arm of the machine. And I, I haven't fixed it yet, but I, um, I'm assuming that the um, rotary hook uh, there might be a burr or or something that they need to to address in that area. What are you laughing at there, Jeff? 
Eric says, you mean we don't do random frame outs in the middle of the fill and tag? <laughs> so Me and Matt both saw that one come in and laughed yeah. at the same time. So Way to tell everyone ahead of time. If you watch our last week's episode where we were talking about, or one of the things I brought up was, do you send out your designs to your customers if they request it? That's what you do. You throw in a few frame outs, but not frame outs. Frame outs. Needle outs. And be like, well, it runs fine on our machine. <laughs> yeah. I need to stop doing those random frame outs. <laughs> we'll Just see how your operators watch this. Like Justin, you got a random frame out here. <laughs> Give me the new. I, I, I got to keep them on their toes, so sometimes I throw that in there. Just run it through that uh, uh, DST emulator uh, animator script that I made, and just put every twenty stitches, make it a, a trim, a cut, and frame out. There you That'll go. Really confuse them. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we know what Justin's doing April Fool's Day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they go like me. <clears throat> So, um, where were we? We you were talking about how if it's one needle, then it's likely above the hoop. Gotcha. And if it's all the needles, it's likely below the hoop. Right. So, so yeah, this particular head, uh, we definitely identified that it's happening on on all fifteen needles. So we know that it's going to be somewhere down in the lower part of the arm. Um, like I said, I, I I think I identified that it's probably the the rotary hook. Need to take that off make sure that it's it's not completely damaged that so we need to replace it or sometimes you can just get uh some sandpaper and go through the edges to make sure that there's not a burr or, or something in there that's that's causing that that thread to to shred um a couple other things that he was facing uh that kind of sparked our our tear down of the whole thing was uh uh, after a trim at the beginning of the design, the thread wasn't catching, and so it was pulling out from the bobbin. So he was getting those thread breaks every time the the inching after a, a trim. Um, so again, something like that is is kind of one of those ones where I think the problem can be from top to bottom, anywhere in between. Um, but just narrowing down, you know, the main culprits. A lot of these problems you can go to, uh, you know, cleaning out your bobbin casings. Uh, that's that's one that's that's a common one that you're not cleaning bobbin casings out, you know, every single day, but it can start gunking up, start building up some lint. Um, that can cause some problems as far as tension problems and whatnot. Um, a needle, changing your needle out. Sometimes if you're getting a needle that's that's dull, if it's got a burr in it, sometimes you you know you haven't uh that's threaded it correct. everything if, if i start having any type of problem i change my needle out first because they're like yeah. what two cents ten cents something like that and a lot of times yeah a lot of times you can't take it take care of it so that that's kind of where uh if the operator is having a problem i kind of say you know it's 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 like that that typical tech support questions like have you turn it off and turn your it back computer on. yeah it's it's have you changed out your needle have you cleaned out your bottom casing um but yeah that's it's these particular problems again asking him if it's happening on a single needle on the head uh he's you know watching it run again and discovering that it's again randomly happening on all all needles so again focusing at the bottom so uh as as far as thread trim lengths, uh, problems like that, where it's kind of pulling out um, on, on Archigemas. And I don't know if you guys could tell me if, if there is a setting on your happies and butterflies and racomas, um, but that there is a, 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 a setting on the actual machine that you can change as far as your, your trim lengths or the, the, the amount of thread that it leaves after a trim. So yeah, um, yeah. given that, given that, those type of settings are pretty much on your machine and you don't touch those i wouldn't say that oh you need to go run and change those values unless it's a, a brand new machine and you're having that problem um but given that those settings are the same settings that they you know we've pretty much standard use uh we we did go to the the picker and this is this is one thing on tajima's that i don't know if they've come up 
with a better way to do the pickers in, in the newer machines. Unfortunately, I haven't seen them them run. But the pickers tend to be something that gets thrown off pretty easy. Um, I think I think it's just the way they are assembled and basically two little set screws is, is what creates their position. And if you're not careful, you hit it every time you put your bobbin in and it nudges exactly. a little. Exactly. Next so, thing and, you know, you're cursing. Yeah. So, and, and if you know what the picker is, I don't know if, if you got one there, Matt, you can pull up. <laughs> I don't know where I put it. I was looking for them. So I don't think any of my pictures, no, none of them cover that area. So the the picker is the, there you go, they're going to go try to find one. Uh, the picker is the uh, the little arm that sits in front of your bobbin casing. It's got two little prongs at the top, and it will go in during the trim process and then come back out to its starting position. And so not only are you dealing with the, the depth from forward to, to back uh, adjustment, but that picker actually can be moved up and down as well, the way that it's attached on a, on a Tajima machine. Um, I win. I get popcorn. There you go. There's a picker. So it's got the two little prongs that go in that go to that sit above the the bobbin casing, and that will be when it's engaged that goes in. So you can see that, you know, if it's just slightly up or down as far as off or uh, in and out as far as the starting position, it's not going to either properly go in to the position that it needs to be or even the timing where it's not in long enough because it's not sitting right. Um, that's going to affect your your thread length after a trim. All right. So let's, let's run through and catch some comments here. Um, we had... Miss Cindy can come in. Good evening. And Suzanne says that I'm surprised how many little balls of lint get caught up in the thread path more frequently now than 10 years ago. Uh, not the same machine, but I think thread quality might have changed a little bit. Um, Cindy says I always try to look at the top tension for dust, dirt, sand on the colors I'm running for the logo at the time. Just a constant thing with machines. Um, I also have a lot of leftover parts. <laughs> uh, when I take things apart, um, I just call them uh, spare. Uh, Cindy says, home improvement, tool time with Matt. That should be a whole new segment. <laughs> uh, we have Donald That's coming in. Not a problem. Um, let's see here. Needle and bobbin always. So those are the first things I usually go after, and a lot of times that solves it. Sometimes... It's a bigger problem, but usually that takes care of it. So Cindy has a question. Do y'all keep your same colors of thread on certain needles or do you rotate your colors around? Justin? So, um, yes, it, it's, as far as our primary colors, you know, black, white, navy, blue, and red is, is really big in this town because of the colors that we do. Um, you know, Kelly green, regular yellow, our, our staple colors, they, they are always on the same needles. Um, the position of the machines... I, I wish that we could have every machine have the same colors on every needle, um, but the operators have found just because the uh, the bay that we're in is, is kind of narrow and long and the position of the machines as far as how you access the threads, whether it's from the back or the front, which is easiest for the operator, um, of course, wherever it's easiest to get to is going to be, you know, the, the cones that you're going to be switching out. Uh, on a daily basis is the ones that are the, the non everyday use ones. So I have one operator that has all their primary colors uh, to the, to the backside of their head that they're not going to get to because they actually go around to the backside of the machine. So all the ones that are in the needles that are on the backside is the ones that they change out regularly. Uh, another machine that is kind of up against the wall, she accesses her, her thread from the front of the machine. So of course her her primary colors are towards the backside, um, but again I I wish it was universal, just because like when I jump on the machine, my brain kind of like we always had black on needle fifteen, so I I, I make the mistake of just putting in a 
color sequence without even looking at the thread, just because I'm I'm used to having it at a certain position. But um, but at least it is uniform on each machine. So if you know the operator is on that machine 99% of the time, it's something they get used to. There was one thing that I did see. I think I think Mike may have posted it a while back, uh, but they had like a little dry erase board next to the to the computer of the machine and that way they wrote in their colors so it's not you know looking at the machine and trying to figure out what needle it is counting you know spaces of <laughs> needles but uh just just writing down the the threads that they have on the machine at that particular time so they can just glance at it that was a pretty cool idea i mean i keep uh i, I have five colors i never rotate out and they are the back and against that that wall right back and against that wall because that's the hardest part to get to right uh, change position so that's where black white um flag red flag blue and i can't remember the other color at this time <laughs> that's where those all live my large my king not king cones the big the big cones and matt takes a picture of it yep that's all i do because i i change all the middle ones uh White and black, so white is always number three, black is number two, number one is a really easy one to change. And mm -hmm. then this is 12 he or twelve needle, so this is all reverse. So this back brownish on the camera right now, uh, going up here, uh, those first four are Air Force OCP colors, so those never change and then everything else changes in, in the middle. And I just climb over the machine and do it he stands on the table. I or actually, what I was doing before I got the other happy, the happy number two, is I just climbed up and sat behind it, and then just changed it on the back. Just had the table off, and I could just set my legs down, and it was more comfortable. But so not Eric says, if they claim the design is at fault, ask if the issue is happening in the same place in the design on repeated runs. That that's actually something I was going to bring up. Yeah, that's that's one thing too. That if 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 you can't narrow it down to a certain head only doing it, a certain needle only doing it, uh, you start. And then they, I even asked him that. I said, "Is it you know when he's saying like I keep having a, a false thread break, or I keep having the the thread uh, on that particular head? I keep having the thread shred on me." And it's like, okay, well, is it at the same spot every single time? You know, is is it is it something in the design that I need to go in there and take a look at? Maybe some small stitches I need to clean up. You know, is it hitting the seam of the hat every single time where I need to adjust something that's to to compensate for for going through that that really thick seam? You know, something like that, where that if it is happening in the same spot of the design every single time, then you know to to look away from your machine and actually look at the design. Yeah. So we'll keep running down the list here. Barb asks, do you have scheduled maintenance or do you wait until you were having issues? We have our, uh, our normal day to day oiling, our weekly oiling. Um, and that just goes by the, the suggested spots that Tajima actually gives you a little chart on the frame of their machines. Uh, we definitely do those. Um, I think we, there is times where uh, I try to utilize anytime we have any type of slowdown in, in production. I, I try to say like, all right, the things that we know that need attention, um, we we try to get to. I think I, I wish we had a more routine schedule as far as maintenance. So things like this wouldn't come up, uh, you know, ripping apart the whole machine at one time. Um, and honestly, you know, Thankfully, we haven't had a slowdown. Typically, January, February in this industry is a little bit slower. We have not slowed down at all. So uh, I was kind of waiting for that little lull uh, to to address these issues, but it, it, and it, it never got, came. It never came, and it got to a point. It's like you know what? Him fighting the machine, him getting frustrated, running this order actually is going to take longer uh, than just stopping. We kind of threw them. The order on another machine kind of shifted gears and just said you know let's do it now and that way it's done a couple of days machine down is you know in the long run hopefully when everything's back up and we got everything set that that machine's going to be running like a dream yeah and we have antonio asking will this help with tension issue so i mean if you're having issues sometimes it's best just to reset 
take it apart, mm -hmm. put it all back together. You know, there, there's a reason that when you start having upper thread tension issues or upper thread issues, the first thing is always, did you rethread the needle? Did you rethread it again? Mm -hmm. Did you rethread it a third time? Because I I've seen it too, where like you're you're going and you run it through the disc, and you keep coming down and you look back up and it's now out of that disc because you didn't get it under the little peg, and so it's those types of things that can catch you, right? Um, and you can rethread your machine eight hundred times and it could still be wrong, <laughs> but usually if you do it one or three times, you you've got it. But it it's definitely you know sometimes you just need to take the tensioners off need to clean the lint and the gunk and the crud out of them and then just start over exactly and, and even on older machines you know given that these things have been over the years cranked down and loosen crank down and loosen even you know taking apart um if you if you do regularly do that maintenance you gotta look at the springs you know if you if you have them where they're sitting uh by themselves and they're all you know yay tall when they're not at at, at any tension and you have one that's yay big you know that spring's not going to be doing its proper tension when it when it gets cranked um you know loosen screwed down or loosen so yeah, yeah the, a lot of times and you know i i tend to to kind of when you're when you're going through this troubleshooting definitely try to do the easiest things first you don't want to you have a tension issue go <laughs> take your head done off. and just take your head off and every <laughs> all the all the springs and tensioners um but if, if you do the normal stuff, like, you know, check your bobbin, clean out your bobbin casing, switch your needle out, um, check your pathing. Even if, like you said, take it off the thread from, from the very top tension, pull it out, start from new to make sure that your path, you know, sometimes where you're you're pulling on that, that top spring and you're trying to make sure that it's not wrapped around that top post too many times and you, you, can, you know, you quite can't see the angle that you're at just pull it out you know it's quicker just to kind of path it and like like jeff said i've i've done it before where you're pathing through you know the first three obstacle course that your your thread's going through and by the time you're coming down to the needle you you know you watch yourself path it properly but because there's not ten, you know that much tension on that thread it may have come off one of those those tensioners or yeah, you know, out of the thread brake wheel and now it's wrapped around it from behind. Exactly. Or so I had it go around the stupid little peg on the side before or get caught up underneath the plastic and that <laughs> added way too much tension. Right. Yeah. A lot of times if you um why I have and, 30 of them here. And I, I recommend that people do this, you know, grab and pull three feet through every needle. Because a lot of times if it's tension related and you grab onto that and you're pulling it through, you'll feel the difference between all the needles. And they should all feel the same when you're dragging them through. And so it's it's one of those things that, you know, you'll ask people, how do you set your tensions? What gauge do you use? Um, and you ask new people and they're like, I use this gauge and I set it to this. And you ask people that have been running machines for forever and they say, well, I just do it by feel. Right? So... Mm -hmm. And, 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 uh, and honestly, I've always, t I've always learned by feel and, and when, you know, when you grab it and, and you can feel that it's like, all right, if I pull this any, any more, the needle's going to snap, you know, for a fact that, that that's just not a tension that's off that that thread somewhere in that thread path, there's something grabbing onto that thread, whether the thread is, is wrapped underneath the, uh, the cone itself. You know, well, it's, it's not in the cone. It's not in the cone. Uh, I've had it where, you know, at the bottom of the Madeira cone, they have those little notches where you're supposed to, you know, clamp the end of your thread when you're when you're putting it away. I've seen it where it actually catches on that. Um, um, but yeah, I, I actually just ordered one of those digital uh, tensioners tension today. Gauges. Yeah, tension gauges to, to kind of, like I said, we're starting from zero. We want every head exactly the same, so we so we know that we're starting from a level playing ground across the board. So, so I'm ready for Matt's story about his tension gauges. Right. So I'm actually going to bring up Donald's question here, asking about did you get better results using tension gauges? So, 
like Justin just said that they're going to start from zero. And really what I recommend using the gauges for is getting all your needles and tensions on an even playing field. And then calibrate it and fine tuning by running your H, I, Fox, whatever test you want to run. Um, the reason why I have three different ones is because, uh, well, this one's just for bobbin, apparently, because they that's how that works. And this one's your top one. Lo and behold, you can use it for both, but um, it's a little harder and whatever. Um, but I was having some really weird, I don't even remember what the issues were. I don't know if Jeff does, but you're, you have a really weird tension issues. Yeah, it was, it made no sense because uh, uh, this was, I think this was actually when I got the happy because I was talking to Renee and I'm like, what am I supposed to do for tension? He's like, I normally run a, a one to five ratio. I'm like, that's what I'm doing. But it's like not right. So I was running uh, 20 ish in the bobbin and then like 150 in the upper 120, whatever. And it was not running right. There was, it was really bad. Turns out that the spring in this is not correct or something's up with it, that this, my ratio was way off. Um, so then I just bought this guy for, I think, like 80 bucks or something. And it does both the the bobbin and the top thread um, with one gauge. So then you're using one sensor to actually do that. So I didn't touch any of the tensions, set it up using these at uh, 130, 125 or whatever, and uh, 20. Then went with this, and it was way off on the, the upper thread. So... That's Hence where why that by the digital. Yeah, that I'm just saying this one right here is garbage. I just keep it because it's a good talking point. Yours is probably better. This one was just faulty. Um, and yeah, like yeah, I never use it, but this one's really nice. Um, it looks like it's got magnets, so you can just stick it to the machine. Oh, well, I added. I just super glued oh. some magnets, so I, I can. Was like, it's yeah, a magnet. That's it. awesome. And then this one I have hook. Or a loop Velcro mm -hmm. on the side because uh, I just put the little Velcro dots on the table, just two of them, and then I could set this right on the table, stick the the bobbin in, and then it'll stay. And then this one I just slap it to the side of the happy so I don't lose it because that's too efficient. I couldn't find it. Oh, <laughs> Magnetize everything. I call this apparent efficiency. There you go. I'm gonna grab a few more comments here. So, um, boom, 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 boom. Love the gauge conversation. And what is the gauge Matt is showing? So Matt has, I uh, believe the digital one is the TOA. Yeah, the TOA digital bobbin gauge. So you do have to be careful when you order them. Um, there is the, like if you watch Ramona's thing, I just watched it before we started. So she was talking about how there's M and L. L. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know why I forgot the one that I actually use, um, but there are different inserts. Mine just happened to come with it. Uh, it wasn't supposed to, but it did. So I guess I got lucky. Bonus uh, shopping. Yeah. But uh, you have to buy that separate unless if you can find it. Um, I think I got mine from so many parts.com. Um, I'm pretty yeah, sure. We, we, we just ordered ours from Madeira today. I think it was, I think they're up to about a hundred and yeah. 25 something like that now yeah and they uh that I, I do believe matt says that he would buy that three times over yeah yeah i yeah. definitely would yeah we definitely we ordered that today because i want to hear to to when he is finishing up which i'm hoping by the end of tomorrow we have it all put back together um i definitely want to to like i said start from zero have that that level playing field so we we know that we can kind of fine tune all your heads to where they need to be. So Antonio asks, what range should it be? Um, I mean, I guess that's range. That, like Madeira, actually, if you run Madeira threads, they have it listed on their website of what you want to set them to. Um, and then, I mean, typically it's like a, a four to one or a five to one ratio. Um, that's my official answer. So <laughs> I don't know what Justin's going to say or Matt's going to say, but that's that's my answer. Yeah, I I would definitely go by your your thread manufacturer. That's that's going to yeah. be the best bet. Usually they post it, or if not, you can call them and ask them, and they'll tell you. 
Um, so the name of the dual gauge against the, the Toa uh, gauge. And it looks like, Justin, you want to pull something else up? No. No, I was. Oh. Okay. So, yep. 14, 12, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So that's <laughs> the downside with digital is that it, it updates way too much. So if you're if you're trying to go for that 20, 23 and a half or whatever, it's you just got to kind of be like, OK, I've seen 20 enough. Uh, this this is a new um, bobbin case, which is why it's so low. Yeah, you definitely want to watch like I was I was chatting with Jeff earlier when okay. I was looking to order it. Um, you definitely want to watch the video on how to properly uh, thread the thread through the through the gauge. Yep. And it does say to to pull the thread as as even in, in, in the same pace as you possibly can and on an even pull uh, to try to get that that tension gauge. Um, so I see Cindy was asking about the tension gauge. I did get I did order the one that Matt's showing there. That's the Toa. Um, I got it from Madeira, but I, th I think it's one of those things. It's not specifically a Madeira product, so you can probably I mean, find it. On you can get it anywhere. They sell it on Amazon. It's yeah, just you're gonna, it's two hundred dollars on Amazon right now. Yeah, prices right. fluctuate based off of who you're purchasing it from. Yeah, There's the actual new one with the screw. The other one didn't even have the screw in it, so you can see now this is Filtex Magna Glides and a brand new bobbin case. That's pretty pretty dang consistent. And that's my reach. And then there's even a uh, cut thread cutter on it. Oh, nice. Although that's a little, a little bit too long. That's all the way down here. But, <laughs> and then wrap around the pigtail, and it's good to go at thirty. So, so, so back back in the day, uh, when I was learning tensions, the you know you you put it through the, the little side of the bobbin, you put it through the pigtail. And it was always, yep, you you yo -yo like it. It, yeah, you yo yo it, and that's when you you find the proper tension. So back for all these these fancy dancy tools that we can buy now and use. I can just I, see you in the shop whipping it down. It didn't come back up. <laughs> Honestly, this is really helpful if you have old springs on your your embroidery machine, like you're saying. Like over time, after they're compressed for so long, they're going to get weaker. If you use this, you can find out and you can turn them all so that you get 120, whatever your range is on all of them, run your test and then be like, okay, this one is uh, whatever, too much bobbin showing. Look at our uh, needle chart that, or tension gauge chart that we have. And then you can determine, well, that one, I got to tighten it, that one loosen it. It just kind of sets it very, very even. Cause yeah, you can go through and what I tried to do when I first started was set the first one and the last one and take a straight edge like a ruler and just bring them all up. Same height. And it, it looks like it would work until you don't realize that your springs are all different tensile strengths over time. So Right. Yeah. Um, Curious to using it on Baradin. The reason I ask is because you just don't freely pull your thread from the needle. Um, I, I would check with you, Baradin. I think I, I bet you, they have a video or something. Well, don't you, when you're pulling through to, to set it on the gauge, don't you take it out of your needle anyways? You shouldn't because you shouldn't. as soon as you put it through a needle, you're going to up it. Unless if you're setting all of them the to way. like you lower it a little bit, like a hundred and 10 or 115 and then you have to compensate that for your um which i guess what you could do is if you're doing all that set one up one needle up run it through get that 120 then pull it out of the needle then run it through and then see what your difference is and then you just subtract that from everyone then you don't have to thread it through so yeah i want to say that the in the instructions they tell you to run it through the needle but Justin's pulling it up. I can see. And I it. and I do believe if you look at the instructions for this, it says not to put it through the pigtail. But some yeah, I think that they run it through. on the bobbin. It, it, on the bobbin, it does say not to put it through the pigtail. Now, what if your bobbin doesn't have pigtails? 
<laughs> you still don't use it. Yeah. Well, this bobbin reader is dead. Yep. Oh, yeah. And, and, uh, yeah kind of... Make sure that your bobbin cases have all the screws in. Like, this one is missing one. And I have definitely put it in the machine before, thinking it was good, and wondered why it was trash. But all I will right. still save it. So I'm going to come down here to a comment from Suzanne. Um, she says, on the Baradin, there's a setting that you can release the lock, and then you can pull it. Um, so I guess that would be a setting in the machine. Uh, Candace says, with my first professional machine, I adjusted until I got the perfect H test and had so many problems. I finally bought a tension gauge, and my top and bottom were so tight it wasn't even funny. I might have to get the digital one that looks a lot nicer than my old one. And Justin's watching YouTube videos. <laughs> Ew, ads. Ads in ads. What do they call it? Inception? <laughs> Adception. Adception. <laughs> I, I will say I totally just picked this out of the box and tried to use it and I couldn't figure out how to thread it. So I was just going to yeah. sharpie lines and then I was like, oh, you know what? Maybe it could look down line. It looks yeah. like they're going through the needle. Yeah. Yeah, and you want to do it as straight down too. Right. Which they're not doing. They're pulling it at a 90 degree angle. Yeah, because you got to remember you're 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 threading through the uh, you thread up and down the front of the needle. Yeah, it's not so a horizontal thread path. If you have that to completely making a U turn and you're you're holding your tension, you know, above your needle, that's going to add a lot more tension on your on your pull. So definitely follow the the manufacturer. Uh, suggestions on how to how to use it otherwise it's definitely not going to work for you so yeah and then you'll get wrong results and be unhappy and throw the tool away and or across the room i'm pretty sure matt threw his <laughs> long one across the room when he found out it was no, but i lost this for a good year i couldn't find it i was going to order another one and then it popped up and then it showed up like, that's okay. good that it showed up before you ordered a new one because usually yeah, right. when i order something it gets here and then i find the old one yeah it's as soon as receipt in hand the other one shows up yeah so cindy says justin matt or jeff maybe bring information to ag um we can i could probably bribe matt to bring his tension gauge i don't know he's he is driving i don't know if tsa is gonna allow it on my truck <laughs> TSA is gonna allow TSA. it on your truck yeah, that extra mortgage is going to take to fill up your tank so that you can get I mean, it. speaking of it, are there going to be a bunch of them uh, fancy little chopsticks at uh, AG that we can buy? Fancy little chopsticks? Yes, they are. I'm going to have a whole mess of them. I just have to show everybody mine's brown. Slash purple. I got, I got the are original he, ones. He's got two in the same sleeve, huh? I don't even know if I have one here. You don't even have your own product? Yes, I do. <laughs> they work really good for Chinese food. They so uh hard. you can grab it, stab it, or you can slice it with the uh the back end. The back end. It's my fidget toy slash bobbin adjusting bobbin tension adjusting screwdriver. Yeah, you know, right. speaking of, of, of pathing and, you know, sometimes trying to get in between those little wheels and, and areas, I have used the, the, the tip of the Puff Pro and kind of use that as, as my guide to kind of grab the thread and just move it over whatever it is that I'm trying to, to run into the path. So, yeah, I extra, use extra bonus. I use the chopstick going around the tension wheel because mm -hmm. I, my fingers just don't fit in there. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 pretty compact in between all those little. Uh, those so, and... Cindy says I already have mine. She picked it up faster than you, did, Justin. Boom. Uh, I'm using my fancy chapstick right now. It's serious life <laughs> lifesaver. And Eric says that's the model. Get you a mess of them fancy little chopsticks. 
And for those of you that don't know, we are referring to the 3D Puff Pro tool that Mr. Justin Armenta invented. Yeah, so all these tight little spots in here, they definitely can help you using something that's a little bit thinner and, and skinnier than your finger that you know, kind of helps you guide trying to get into those paths. So, Cindy says tweezers. I use something not tweezer mm -hmm. Usually because I can't ever find my tweezers and I can find other things easier than my tweezers. <laughs> I don't have enough of those around the, the shop yet. So I have one more thing. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> I have one more thing that I... Uh, that's done. <laughs> Google got me again? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I saw, I heard the click coming from Arizona there. So, I, I knew uh, it was from Arizona. So, here we, uh, I have a rotary hook. I don't know if I'm going to be able to show it, but you were talking about burrs on it. And yes. there you go. Up, up. Yep. You can see there maybe you go. right. I've moved my finger right here. Yeah. There are some marks if it'll, I don't know, but if I had my fancy key. Oh, there it focused for a second. Yeah, you can definitely see the nick on there. Yep. But yeah, so there's a nick. So whenever the the, the hook is, not the, the actual outside part is going to be rotating, and then your thread is going to ride along this outer edge. If there's a nick on it from your, your needle hitting it, that's going to fray it every single time it goes around. So right. that's where you're saying a little sandpaper. I just take my Dremel and I have a, uh, like a buffer bit mm -hmm. and I just sit there and I buff it for like 10 minutes until it makes it nice and smooth. Yeah. That's one thing. I, uh, a tech that was working on a machine a while back, he was saying that a lot of people have a tendency to just throw it in the trash and get a new one. Um, that can be pretty spendy. They're um, 80 bucks each. Yeah, exactly. So if, if it is something where you can definitely identify that or even just know, kind of learn the surfaces that you that you that your thread is come in contact with and, and the parts that the, the moving parts on that, um, the sandpaper or the buffing, try that first. It can save you 80 bucks. Uh, another yeah. thing that a lot of people don't realize and by a lot of people, I've never actually asked anyone, but this, um, you know what? One second. Let me grab my chopstick okay so right here uh that's still not helpful either right there is a groove that runs right through here and there's actually a bunch of them this entire raceway has grooves on it that'll fill up with lint and that's that's what's supposed to grab oil and fling it around inside of this so that it spins freely uh this one has no oil in it at all because it's been cleaned uh, so it's it spins a little bindy. Um, that's where so you got to make sure that you you clean that out. Yes, it's binding. You said bindy, I'm not binding. binding. Oh, There's okay. a G on the end. Go back and watch the replay. Listen, I to will. It. And then I'll the probably say something inappropriate or whatever. I don't know. But so yeah, I mean that is part of the every morning. Uh, my operators, we do have a a hose that comes into the embroidery room from the compressor that's on our screen print side. Um, but they do go through and they blow out first and then they oil. So, you know, hoping that the, the everyday lint and all that does, that does, that's not totally gunked up in there. That is kind of free flowing. You blow it all out, you oil it, and hopefully you don't have those problems that, you know, build up over time. Awesome. Well, I mean, we are a, Officially, there's five minutes over the hour. Um, so I don't know if you guys had anything else you wanted to cover. Uh, if not, we'll go ahead and close out. Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, like like always, if, if you do have a question or you're having a problem that, uh, that you can't identify and you do want to ask some questions, definitely ask in the group or in Discord. You have our Discord hey, is better. Hey, Justin, you have our, do, you have, do you have your tool? You've got one, right? Ask him yeah. about a tool. Hold on. So we have a question, and we'll do that. And it says, how do I buy a chopstick? So go, Justin. Go to 3dpuffpulltools.com. And uh, the upper right, it'll uh, have a link for you to buy. Right now, our uh, home of the 3D Puff Pro 
3D Puff Pro tool is uh, with Sunfacer Manufacturing. Uh, we are out of stock right now. Uh, we are supposed to get our stock back in within the next couple weeks. Um, but there are a few uh, distributors out there that are carrying them. And I'm not sure if they do have stock, but you can check with them. If you are in the U.S., uh, you can check with uh, Pinpoint. Uh, Madeira also carries them. Um, I'm going to kick myself. Um, do you have a vendor list on the website? I do not. I should add that. There you go. Um, There's your homework. <laughs> the U.S. is uh, is uh, Pinpoint, Madeira, Sunfacer is the home of the of the Puff Pro tool. Cindy says and, GSG. Uh, GSG. And where is Renee from? Tex-Mac. Tex-Mac. Tex-Mac as well. So those are the, the U.S. distributors that do carry them. Uh, again, Sunfacer is out of stock right now. Uh, but I think Madeira might carry them right now. So, and buckets of ink, uh, he might have some in stock as well. There you go. All right. Sorry to interrupt. I just wanted you to get your commercial. In. Thank you. <laughs> Back to you, Jeff. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I don't have anything else. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and close this out here. Wait, wait, that, wait, wait. Does everyone know about AG? I don't know. Does everybody know about AG? Who, I guess we'll do that. So. Know about AG, raise your hand. Do you have your uh, your links there, Matt? Your links list that you can post up there? Yeah. It's Matt, the you, get, you get ready. I'll, I'll do the EMBnerd.com. <laughs> That's it. So we, all three of us will be teaching at Applicate Getaway this summer. Uh, currently, um, I believe Justin's doing one class, Matt's doing one class, and I will be helping with Matt's class, as well as doing one with uh, my son and then uh, one on my own. Um, you can go ahead and click on that link right there to register. They have three different packages. The first one is show floor access. So you'll be able to go and see all the booths and purchase items, that kind of stuff, fun stuff. The second one is kind of like a pay your own way. So you get to register for a few classes. You can pick and choose what classes you want to take and register for those. And then there's like a VIP type uh level that you can get that you pretty much get access to everything so that's going to be a lot of fun it's going to be july 15th through the 17th in or i think it's in irving texas but it's in dallas fort worth sheridan i believe uh so i would definitely jump in there and get signed up for classes now if you haven't because you never know when they're going to sell out or fill up completely so yeah mine sold out already yep <laughs> we'll, we'll say that but we don't really know um but it'll be a lot of fun uh, and we will all be there so stop by you'll be able to see us and we will i think i have like three or four spots left in my class so you gotta hurry up and sign up for it <laughs> you guys all right so other than that uh i don't think we have any other announcements do you guys um, no, um not, nothing right now we are getting pretty close to 5,000 members in the embroidery group. If you are not in the group, please go to uh, Facebook, search for the embroidery nerd group, and you will be able to join there. Make sure you answer the, the what is it, four questions now, or is it still three? I four. don't know. Answer all the questions, because <laughs> if you don't answer all the questions, you won't get in. The Make two sure people that approve are up there. Yep. Uh, that's all I got. Other than AG that we're coming up on, uh, we're getting close to 5,000 members. We might, may or may not be doing something special for that too. So stay tuned and join the group. Um, That's way easier just to click this link. The link. We, we have every single social media, uh, social media, and, and the links. converters on there too. There all the go. links are at links.embnerd.com. So and maybe all, we'll the, all the, the important links. Yeah. Maybe we'll put the 3D Puff Pro link on there too if uh, we get some sponsored. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could just see the popcorn. We went and, and, down. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, we're done for the day. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So, with that, guys, that is Justin Armento from JA Digitizing Studios. We have Matt Enderly from Patch Braid. And I'm Jeff Fuller from Fuller Embroidery Works. And we are all here uh, representing the Embroidery Nerd. And we will catch you guys next week. Bye.